video lecture for environmental science for Wednesday, January 24th. Uh, I'm sorry I'm a day late with this lecture. Um, ran on into a little trouble yesterday trying to get this finished, but anyhow, here goes. Where we left off, we were talking about energy, and we defined energy as the um, ability to do work or to provide heat. And this is just a schematic of how the chloroplast works in plants. And this is a pretty busy slide, but I'll go ahead and break it down. Um, coming into the plant chloroplast is water. Okay, so here's H2O over here. And also plants take up carbon dioxide and the water goes into what are called light dependent reactions. Light dependent reactions are based on chlorophyll. They need chlorophyll to work. And in light dependent reactions, water is split and made into oxygen and hydrogen. You can see that water is H2O, so you would expect that when it was split, it would make hydrogen. Here it's making a hydrogen ion, and then it would make oxygen, diatomic oxygen, O2. And this is done by chlorophyll and the chloroplast. Chlorophyll is energized by light energy, and when it's energized, then it's able to accomplish the splitting of water. Okay. At the same time that it splits water, it makes a high energy molecule called ATP. That ATP is cycled to what are called light independent reactions, and then it becomes adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and it's recycled back to the chlorophyll, where it becomes ATP again. Now, in light independent reactions, the hydrogen mixes with the carbon dioxide, and that creates carbohydrates. And this is not the molecular formula for glucose, but what is what is called the empirical formula for glucose. And the carbohydrates like glucose leave the light independent reactions and then can go all over the plant so they can facilitate the physiology of the plant. Okay, so just breaking down photosynthesis, here's the overall chemical reaction. Uh, we have six waters plus six carbon dioxides, and that combines with solar energy, which is captured in chlorophyll, and that makes this molecule called C6H12O6, which is the chemical formula for glucose, and then six oxygens. Now, glucose is the backbone for the rest of carbohydrate chemistry in the cell. It's an energy-rich component and it's a building block for all the different macromolecules. Remember, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids uh, in the plant. Uh, if we look at cellular respiration, that occurs in an organelle called the mitochondria. And this is the reverse reaction of photosynthesis. And so if we just take photosynthesis in reverse, uh, this does not require light energy. Uh, obviously, um, uh, respiration occurs in humans, it occurs in animals, it occurs in all life, and so cellular respiration does not require any type of photosynthetic component because we as humans, we don't collect light that way. Uh, but we take glucose plus oxygen, and then, oh, my reaction is wrong, look at that. That should say carbon dioxide plus water, shouldn't it? Okay, I've got glucose plus oxygen goes to glucose plus oxygen and released energy. That is wrong. Uh, it should be C6H12O6 plus 6O2 goes to 6H2O plus 6CO2 plus released energy. So please make a note of that on your notes that that is wrong. So photosynthesis is energy captured and converted into glucose. Respiration is energy released and converted to ATP wherever it is needed. Respiration occurs regardless of the presence of sunlight. Okay, so you can see how uh, in an ecosystem, photosynthesis and respiration would act hand in hand. Okay, so in photosynthesis, we have sunlight. 
um, that energizes the green plants. Uh, the green plants then produce oxygen through photosynthesis and they take up carbon dioxide and water. They also produce high energy sugars and these sugars then can be conferred to primary consumers like rabbits, okay, and also then to decomposers, okay, they're taking in oxygen from the system and they um, undergo respiration. In respiration, there's a release of heat energy, there's a release of water, and there's a release of carbon dioxide. And also, as a part of the metabolism of this rabbit here, these mushrooms, and this earthworm, there's high quality, quality energy for work, for biosynthesis of macromolecules, for moving and membrane transport, and then more esoteric things like bioluminescence for animals that provide their own light source. Now, <clears throat> to take a little bit of a turn here, we need to talk about the difference between populations, communities, and ecosystems. Okay, so we would define, you know, starting with the species level, we would define a species as all organisms that are sufficient, sufficiently genetically similar to breed and produce live fertile offspring. So within a species, if uh, species come together, they reproduce, then their progeny or their children should be also fit to reproduce. Now, there's certain interspecies breeding. Uh, the most classic example is if you breed a horse and a dog donkey, you get a mule, but the horse and the donkey are separate species, and when they breed, they do produce offspring, but the offspring are not fertile. It's only the very, very rare instance that a mule can reproduce. Most mules, uh, by and large, are sterile. So within a species, you can re reproduce. However, if reproduction is tried um, across species, then at best, the offspring will be infertile. At worst, there won't be any type of offspring. Now, if we look at the next level of life, if we count all of the members of the species, same species in a, in a given area, we would call that a population. Okay, so when we're talking about the population of Redding, California, we only talk about the people. We're not talking about the population of the people, the snakes, and the amoebas. We're only talking about one species. Okay. Then, if we, at that point, add up all of the living things, all the populations in a given area, say the city of Reading, then we would call that a community. A community includes all living species, but nothing that's inanimate. So a chair would not be a part of the community, or a desk. But animals, plants, uh, protists, and fungi all make up a community, as well as bacteria and archaea. Then, if we look at all things in a given area, say cars, trees, um, other types of plants, animals, um, chairs, roads, things that are living and non-living, then that's what makes up the ecosystem. And that is the second highest uh, level in the hierarchy of life. The next would be the biosphere, which is not on here, but the biosphere is all living and non-living things that are on the habitable portion of Earth. Okay, and mostly in this class, we'll talk about ecosystems. Now, if we look at food relationships among species, we'll see that everything relies on the producers. The producers are primarily green plants, and these are organisms that produce organic materials via photosynthesis. So they need to have some type of photosynthetic mechanism. This would include plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. All of them have chlorophyll in some way, shape, or form. They convert carbon dioxide, uh, which is a chemical form of carbon that's inorganic, into organic material like carbohydrates, lipids, uh, nucleic acids and proteins. And the given amount of biomass that's produced in a, in a given area of time, um, we call the productivity of an area. So its productivity is actually a rate because it's time dependent. 
And if an area is lush with green plants, then it has a high productivity. If an area is arid, like a desert, and doesn't have a lot of green plants, then we say that it has a low productivity. Now, from this, the food web emanates. And the food web is just individual food chains that are interconnected between different producers and consumers. Um, consumers are the ones that are going to consume the organic materials that are made by the producers. Okay. And at each trophic level, starting at the bottom where the producers are, an organism's feeding status is given in an ecosystem. Okay, and as we go from lower trophic levels to higher trophic levels, the number of organisms decreases, and that creates a sort of an ecological pyramid. The most vast number of uh, organisms in a given ecosystem are the producers. Then you have primary consumers that eat directly the organic carbon from the producers. Then you have secondary consumers that are eating the primary consumers. Then you have tertiary consumers that are eating the secondary consumer. Okay, and you can see that it's a very complex relationship. Here at the very bottom of this figure, we have producers. Uh, these we call autotrophs. Uh, they can produce their own organic carbon. So they're auto, meaning they can produce their own, and troph would be feeding. So they produce the own food that they eat. And so we have star grass here, we have red oak grass, and we have acacia trees. And then you can see all the primary consumers. Uh, these eat the organic carbon directly made from the producers, grasshopper, harvester ant, topi, termite, warthog, dung beetle, hare, and bacteria. And then you'll see that um, other primary con uh, consumers, wildebeest, Thompson's gazelle, impala, mouse. Um, and here's a dead mouse that is on its way uh, to being decomposed. So it's being eaten exclusively by bacteria. This could also be eaten by fungus. Okay, then we have secondary consumers that are primarily carnivores and they're eating the primary consumers. And then at the top of the trophic levels, we have tertiary consumers. And they, these can eat primary consumers. They can also eat secondary consumers. And then consumers that feed at all different levels, we have scavengers, uh, which will scavenge on dead and decay, decaying material. We have depredivores, which will um, scavenge primarily plants, and then decomposers that will decompose all types of de decaying material. Now, to look at other classifications of organisms, depending on what they eat, we would uh, say herbivores are plant eaters. They're primarily consuming plants that have green leafy material that uh, have chlorophyll so they can produce organic carbon. Carnivores you know, as flesh eaters. So they're eating other animals um, uh, as small as an earthworm, as large as a wildebeest, and these carnivores are considered flesh eaters. Omnivores eat both. Scavengers eat dead carcasses of larger animals. Detritivores eat litter, debris, and dung. Ooh, gross, okay. Uh, and then decomposers are responsible for the final breakdown and recycling of organic material. So organic material is broken down into inorganic. That way it can be picked up as nutrition uh, by plants, along with carbon dioxide and water, which are picked up to make oxygen and glucose. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the different cycles at this point. So I'm going to show a few different figures. And here's the first figure. This is the water cycle. And so there are a few things that you need to know from the water cycle. So in going up in the water cycle, we have evaporation that comes from soil, streams, rivers, and lakes. And for the entire earth, that would be 30,000 cubic kilometers. Okay, then we have transpiration from vegetables and transpiration from vegetables um, is 
where or vegetation, excuse me, um, is 4,100, uh, 41,000 cubic kilometers. Then the primary mode for population, populating the air with water would be evaporating from the ocean. And then coming back down, we have precipitation over the ocean, precipitation over the land. And then finally, we have runoff from uh, freshwater sources to saltwater sources. And then groundwater, which percolates through porous rock and soil. Okay, and that's where if you're drilling a well down below the water table, that's where you're getting groundwater. Then we have the carbon cycle. Okay, in the carbon cycle, uh, you can see that uh, this is listed in what are called gigatons, or not millions of tons, but billions of tons. And photosynthesis. We've got um, 100 gigatons being photosynthesized, so that's carbon dioxide being fixed from the atmosphere into green plants. Then existing plants are about 650 gigatons. Uh, respiration gives off 100 gigatons. Land clearing and burning gives off two gigatons, okay? So you can see the cycle is going back into the air as carbon dioxide is being released. Uh, burning fossil fuels, five gigatons. And then atmospheric CO2 over oceans, um, 92 gigatons is being dissolved in water. And then 91 gigatons is being released from the oceans. And so you can see in down here, um, Photosynthesis is being done by plankton, uh, or excuse me, plankton is doing photosynthesis and respiration, depending on whether it's photosynthetic or not. And then organic sediment is locking up organic carbon at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, and so you can see processes like respiration um, and burning of fossil fuels, land clearing and burning are creating atmospheric CO2 and then processes of photosynthesis and also dissolving um, CO2 in the oceans are depleting CO2 from the environment. Okay. And material that stores carbon, we call carbon sinks. This would be like plants or the ocean uh, or lakes and other bodies of water where carbon can be dissolved. When carbon is released from these sinks, the cycle may not be able to keep up with, the, um, and that will allow for increased CO2 in the atmosphere. Increased CO2 in the atmosphere acts like um, actually glass in a greenhouse, and that will trap in heat in the atmosphere and keep it from being released and emanated back out into space. That net increase in temperature is what we know as climate change. Okay. And this leads then to atmospheric heating. So as more CO2 accumulates in the environment, then the atmosphere gets warmer and we start to do things like loose polar ice caps. Okay. Here's the next cycle, which is the nitrogen cycle. And uh, nitrogen can be fixed uh, by bacteria. Nitrogen fixing bacteria produce ammonia. Um, ammonia in the soil can be nitrified to nitrates, and nitrates are very important because plants can absorb these primarily. They'll also absorb ammonia NH3 or ammonium NH4, and they use these to make primarily proteins and nucleic acids, uh, which are organic compounds. Okay, these are eaten by animals, and then the nitrogen is excreted primarily in their urine and feces. These are then decomposed, and when they're decomposed by decomposers like mushrooms, then they go back into the soil as ammonia, okay? And then the ammonium can be nitrified back again by bacteria. Uh, Denitrifying de bacteria in the environment will actually take nitrate. They compete with the plants for nitrate, and they will take nitrate, convert it back to nitrogen gas, and that will go back into the environment. Um, 
actually fossil fuel plants, like here's a coal burning fire uh, a power plant, uh, can also produce nitrogen in the atmosphere at a very, very great rate. This is teragrams or one trillion, trillion of a gram. Here, that's what TG means. Okay, so nitrogen in the atmosphere uh, is converted from NO, uh, NO3, nitrate, to nitrogen, uh, nitrogen gas, or it's converted from organic sources into inorganic nitrogen in the atmosphere, and then it's replenished. Okay. Now, when excess nutrients like nitrogen run off into waterways, then this nutrition will feed the top layer of waterways, and you start to see blooms of things like algae in excess at the very, very top of the very, very uh, level of the water. Okay, and this is called eutrophication. And when you see a lake that looks like this or like this, with lots of green algae at the very, very top layer just floating on top of the lake, then you know that eutrophication is in play, that some uh, excess nutrition has been dumped into this particular waterway. And it's great for the algae that's growing, but it depletes oxygen from the lake or the river or the stream. And when oxygen is depleted, then the life below the algae cannot get sufficient oxygen or sufficient sunlight from sunlight being blocked. And that causes the aquifer to die. Okay, so the top layer may look living in, uh, in full bloom, but the fish, the plankton, the other animals and plants below cannot get enough sunlight, cannot get enough oxygen, and that is eutrophication. Okay, here's the phosphorus cycle. And you can see that phosphorus is lifted up through geological up, uplift. And phosphorus is not airborne, so we don't see phosphorus in the atmosphere. But it's being lifted up by uh, continental drift and uplift of mountains all the time, okay, primarily in phosphorus. Uh, this is weathered and mined by phosphate rocks. Okay. Uh, animals are um, also getting phosphate from the environment, from plants, okay, and this as the animals decompose or uh, from their waste products, then the phosphorus is eaten by bacteria and then they, that goes back into the soil. Again, this is uh, expressed in teragrams. A lot of this will leach into the water and the phosphorus then will go into plants. Actually, will be, actually go into stream and tributaries, and then it will run off into the ocean where it's eaten by marine organisms and also uh, deposits in the sediments at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, and then finally the sulfur cycle. Sulfur is airborne as as CO or as SO2 emissions. Okay, so you do see atmospheric sulfur which when accumulating at high levels becomes a pollutant um, and becomes toxic to humans. So we have to be careful with that. Uh, this will uh, deposit into the environment, both wet and dry deposition, okay? Can run off into the ocean, uh, both from dry land, also from water. Uh, and when you precipitate, this creates H2SO4, H2SO4 is sulfuric acid, and that's acid rain. You primarily see the effects of acid rain on the East Coast, where the soil is primarily contain, containing granite rock, and granite rock does not neutralize sulfuric acid, and so the lakes and the streams become highly acidic. And some of the lakes and streams in, upstream, in upstate New York have completely died off because of the lowering of pH because of all the sulfuric acid that's run off from the environment. So that's when you hear of acid rain, it's this type of precipitation uh, from sulfuric acid. Um, then uh, sulfate is lifted up in the environment. Uh, Due to volcanic activity, it can be released. Due to coal-fired power plants and other emissions, it's released into the environment. And some dust and then biogenic gas, um, a lot of gases excreted from organisms contain sulfur. Uh, then it accumulates again in the atmosphere. Okay. 
Um, there are some organisms that will directly uptake sulfur. Sulfur is involved in sea salt. Okay, and then it is deposited to the bottom of the ocean floor in pyrite, which is a type of chemical that is found in fool's gold. Okay, and that concludes chapter two. At this point, we'll move on to chapter three. In chapter three, we discuss evolution, species interaction, and biological communities. So we're going to very early on this semester start talking about the E word, evolution. And so uh, my philosophy here is to not necessarily give you my opinion on the theory of evolution uh, as compared against intelligent design, but to present a variety of viewpoints. And so I'll talk briefly about it in this chapter. Um, it's unfortunate that I'm doing this via video lecture, but on Monday, uh, what I'll do when I'm back in class is we'll just have a brief discussion about this and then we'll continue to cover the lecture on chapter three. So we will discuss this in class. Um, your opinions count and your opinions matter. Uh, this is a hotly charged debate, especially among Christian circles. Um, but one of the things that I've faced as a scientist is that Evolutionary theories and evolutionary thought is taught almost uh, as dogmatically as any, as you would see in any fact taught um, in non-Christian or secular circles. And so that's just something that you have to deal with. Although it is a theory, it uh, cannot be proven in a laboratory, obviously, because of the complexities of evolution. Um, and I do want to also forewarn you that you have a secular textbook. And so many times they treat evolution as if it's fact. And that's just something that you have to deal with, regardless of your position on evolution um, in Christian circles. But then most evolutionary thought in biological sciences is presented as if it was fact. So anyhow, just as a grain of salt. Okay. And I'm going to go back and do this in slideshow mode. Here we go. Okay, so our objectives in this chapter are to understand how species diversity arises, um, and this can be explained by natural selection as well as mutation within and among different species. We'll discuss how species interact within ecosystems and among different ecosystems. Uh, we'll talk about how populations grow under different conditions where population may be exponentially growing or it might be logistically growing where there's some type of limitations either due to nutrition problems or predation. And then we'll look at community diversity, um, how community diversity arises, abundance within communities and patterns within community structures or the pecking order of the communities from dominant species to those that are more subservient. And then we'll understand how communities change over time uh, as ecosystems weather and under different environmental conditions and in the light of environmental changes. <coughs> so if we look at the theory of evolution, it really can be summed up by two prongs. The first one is natural selection and you should know these definitions for the test, is that certain members within a given species are favored under certain environmental conditions. So if environmental conditions suddenly change, then only a few of the species may survive, but they have adapted to survive under those environmental conditions. If it all of a sudden became very, very hot in Redding, um, and stayed hot, not just for August, but for the rest of the year, then a lot of the cold weather species would die out. So that would naturally select those species and those members within the species that could survive under hot weather conditions. Okay, and then um, the crux of the theory of evolution is common ancestry. And this is that all species on earth came from a single common ancestor. And there are a lot of um, clues uh, 
that would suggest this. There are a lot of clues that could suggest other things. Um, but one interpretation is that um, because of the unifying principles of life, all life has nucleic acid, all life has uh, the other macromolecules, uh, among um, other conclusions, that uh, all species on Earth came from a single common ancestor. Now, this is atheistic evolution, and as atheistic evolution, it doesn't take into account uh, the creation of the Earth or the creation of Adam and Eve. And in Christian and missionary alliance circles, um, we believe that Adam and Eve were uh, part of special creation in the Bible. It states that they were created in the image of God, and that sets them apart as unique from the rest of the plants and the animals and the other things that were created uh, that were not created in the image of God. Okay, so that is, that's something that in the Christian and Missionary Alliance, yes, we do have what are called theistic evolutionists. Uh, we also have people that espouse intelligent design. Uh, but as a matter of course, all um, individuals who are teaching in the Christian and Missionary Alliance um, must teach special creation. We also must teach something from nothingness. So we do teach that the earth and the universe were created from nothing, which is, an, again, a part of the Genesis account. Okay, so the premise, the premises of the intelligent design, as opposed to evolution, are that the earth is young, okay, and this would be what you would hear from somebody who is a strict intelligent design believer. The earth was very young, that's somewhere between 10,000 and 7,000 years old, and that there is no common ancestry and that there is no uh, type of interspeciation. So one species is not necessarily being converted to a different species over time. And that all creation, uh, yes, will exist in a framework of not natural selection, but not in speciation. And by speciation, I mean the evolution or change of one species into another species. So those are the premises of intelligent design. The premises of evolution is that the Earth is very old. And if you look at atheistic evolution, the premise is um, common ancestry, so that all life on Earth evolved from a single common ancestor. And that then is displayed by the unifying principles of life. And that also <clears throat> natural selection then creates different species um, due to different environmental conditions, environmental changes. And so species are continually evolving and adapting to their environments. And this is leading to the evolution where we see uh, we no longer see fossil evidences of things like dinosaurs but we now uh, see life as we know it today based on the environmental condition of the earth. Okay, and there is what is called theistic evolution. Um, really, if you want to uh, find more about intelligent design, then you can go to the Institute for Creation Research, which is based out of San Diego, and that is headed up by Ken Ham. And also within Christian circles, there is a group that espouses evolution. They still believe in special creation of man. Uh, it's called Theistic Evolution, and their website is biologos.org, B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S.org. And they're headed up by Francis Collins, who is the current director of the National Institutes of Health. Okay, so... Um, and in secular circles, again, like I had said before, the theory of evolution is almost accepted as fact. And so as uh, Christians who are scientists, we have to deal with that, uh, regardless of whether you fall, where you fall on the spectrum. In my classroom, I embrace a variety of viewpoints, and I want to honor those viewpoints and have honest discussions about these particular issues. Okay. Now, to break this down, it actually has been shown that natural selection is fact. Okay. And if we look at adaptation, adaptation is something that happens within a species when um, 
and an advantageous advantageous excuse me trait is acquired so once a species learns a new trait or uh, learns a new skill that would be an adaptation to its environment um, suppose that it helps the species to gain food in some way, shape, or form. It helps the species to uh, be able to um, avoid toxins or uh, environmental threats uh, by movement or by burrowing or by some other type of defensive mechanism. We would call this an adaptation. It's something that the species acquires and, and obtains that it did not have before. Okay. And this is different than acclimation. Uh, in accl acclimation, acclimation occurs at the individual level, and this is just a single organism that changes in response to its altered environment, where adaptation is something that happens to a portion of a given species. And then natural selection. This is a process with the in where the individuals with a useful trait that are selected by environmental conditions, pass on those traits to the next generation. So usually this is genetically coded. And so a portion of the population may be favored under an environmental condition. So that portion of the population survives to the point where they can reproduce. And then the offspring uh, then have this favored adaptation and those members of the species who don't necessarily have that adaptation do not survive to the point where they can bear children, they can bear offspring. And so then you see the species change over time because only those with the adaptation are actually uh, growing, dividing, and reproducing. Okay. And the classic example of are giraffes with long necks. The long necks are an adaptation and help the giraffes to feed. So they can feed in things like acacia trees, which are, uh, attain a certain height, and their long necks allow them to get the vegetation, not the low-hanging uh, vegetation, but th those that are higher up in the trees uh, where um, other animals are not able to reach. And so this adaptation has given the giraffes their long necks. Okay. Uh, adaptations also, because they're genetically hard-coded, rely on DNA mutations. And it's a well-known fact that DNA will mutate uh, quite significantly over time. Um, a lot of this has just been found out since the human genome was sequenced in 2003. And we're finding that DNA is much more fluid than what we had originally thought. Okay, and it turns out that mutations to be passed on to successive generations have to occur in sex cells or gametes. These are, are cells that would accumulate in the testes of man and uh, in the ovaries of women. So they're sex cells. Uh, they're going to be fertilized and become eggs and new babies. Uh, but in non-sex cells, uh, what we call somatic cells, uh, these mutations lead to cancer. Okay, mutations in sex cells uh, over and against non-sex cells are passed on to the offspring. And it turns out that a very small slice of these mutations, and this is why evolution depends on long periods of time, because these it's only a small amount of the mutations that are going to lead to adaptations. A small slice of these mutations will give benefit to the next generation. Okay. <clears throat> So given that, we also have to come to grips that there are limiting resources in different environments. Okay, so uh, the limiting factors that are going to allow only certain species to grow or certain members of species to grow include temperature, moisture level, nutrient supply, soil and water chemistry, etc. And for organisms to persist, uh, most organisms turn out to exist only in a very small environmental range, and so limiting factors become very important, and so the environment must stay in these certain conditions. Okay, and once um, factors become limiting, if there is an inappropriate level of a critical environmental factor, like it gets too hot or it gets too cold, it's too moist, it gets too dry, uh, toxins accumulate in the environment, 
then that will cause limitations to different species and the selection process will begin. Also, there's species competition between different species for food sources, for uh, habitats, for oxygen supply, and then finally there's predation where the predators will eat off a particular portion of the ecosystem. Okay. Now, when a single factor, uh, say like a food source in the environment becomes uh, in short of supply, we call that a critical factor. Okay, so if you have lots of organisms, lots of animals that are going to the same watering trough or eating the same type of plants, then that factor that's in the shortest supply, then we call critical. And the critical factor is within tolerance limits. Okay, this is the minimum and maximum levels for environmental factors uh, to allow species to grow and survive, um, heat, cold, and moisture. And then to find these critical factors, what ecologists will do is they will look at indicator species. Uh, these are species in ecosystems who sensitivities can tell us about the environmental conditions, can tell us which uh, environmental factors are critical and which environmental factors are non-critical. Okay, say the saguaro cactus. This is an indicator species. It only grows in a really small uh, slice of the environment because it can only uh, retain a certain level of moisture. It cannot uh, stand uh, moist or very, very cold conditions. The saguaro cactus is highly exposed and under uh, very, very cold conditions, especially at night, it will freeze. And that's why we don't see saguaro cactuses in uh, Redding, California, because it gets cold. Uh, it gets cold at night. It's too cold for a saguaro cactus. So you would start to see, you would see those in Southern California and Arizona and New Mexico and some portions of Nevada. Uh, but it's an indicator species and it indicates a certain environmental condition in which only it will survive. Okay. And so when we look at a different species, um, we can consider the uh, different environmental conditions as a range and in the optimum portion of the range, there's butterflies, then we would see that the species is abundant. And then say on either side, let's say it gets too hot, then there's a zone of um, physiological stress where you infrequently see the species in a zone of intolerance where you would, the species would be completely absent. You would never see a monarch butterfly at the top of Mount Everest. It's just too cold. And then on the other side, the lower limits of the tolerance, you would also see that the species would be infrequent when it started to encounter physiological stress, gets too warm. And then finally, at the Salton Sea, you would never see butterflies because they would be absent. It's just too warm and too salty of an environment. Okay. Now, niche is similar to habitat. Habitat is the portion of the environment where certain species live, but niche is almost like employment for different species in the environment. It's the role that um, a given species plays within its ecosystem. Okay, so it's not necessarily habitat. It's, in, it's, it's like habitat, but habitat is like home. It describes a place or set of environmental conditions in which a particular organism lives. But niche is the role that it plays in its biological community, and it also refers to the different environmental factors that determine the distribution of that particular organism. Okay, uh, if the niche is large, uh, then that gives rise to generalists, and generalists tolerate a wider, wider range of environmental conditions and can exploit a wider range of resources. Okay, specialists have a narrow ecological niche. They can only survive under very specialized conditions. And so you're only going to see them playing a narrow role in their given ecosystem. Okay, for example, here's the giant panda eating eucalyptus. And if you look at a black bear, 
uh, which presumably is a cousin of giant panda bear. Black bear can live in a, a large range of environments. Okay, it can tolerate low levels of precipitation, low levels of temperature. Um, so the black bear we would see in this big white circle here, a large range of environmental conditions. So its niche is more general and it can survive in a wide variety of environments. So you see the black bear in lots of different places uh, in uh, multiple continents. And whereas the giant panda we see in Asia, it is, uh, requires a higher temperature and a higher level of, of uh, precipitation. So it has quite a narrow niche here and we only see it in uh, portions of China and Southeast Asia. It cannot tolerate cold, cannot tolerate dry conditions. Okay. So if a species is known for its environment, say it only occurs in one area or one type of environment like the saguaro cactus in uh, Southern California and Arizona, then we call it an endemic species. The giant panda would be an endemic species to China and Southeast Asia because we only find it at that particular location and under very specialized conditions. Okay. Now, some species can migrate and they can actually expand their ecological niche uh, by inventing new ways of doing things. Okay, so when they have a novel opportunity, a new way to collect food, a new way to avoid a predator, then they uh, will invent new ways. They will uh, exploit some type of adaptation. This would include like elephants. Uh, looking at, at different food sources, chimpanzees and dolphins looking at different ways to acquire food, uh, then that allows them to survive. So they expand their niche um, in that particular way. Okay. And it turns out that species are very, very selective regarding their niches. You'll never find two species sharing a niche. And if two species do share a niche, one will win out over time, okay? So you would never find two species in the same niche for a long period of time. Uh, one would outcompete the other for resources. Uh, one would predate the other, would scare it off. And so a niche usually is a single species that has found its role in a given ecosystem, okay? Now, within features of an ecosystem, like say a given tree, you will find multiple niches, okay? And so you will find what are, what's called resource partitioning. So several species will inhabit this, a certain tree, but some species will be higher or lower. Some species will feed on a certain feature of the tree where other species will feed on a different species, feature of the tree. So if you see, here are different types of warblers. These are different species of warblers, so they don't, they, they're not participating in any type of mating. Uh, but you can see that the Cape May warbler uh, stays on the outside of the tree um, and it stays on a high foraging height. And then as you work your way down, then you get to the black Bernian warbler, the black throated green warbler, the bay breasted warbler, and then finally at the lowest heights, the yellow rumped warbler. And all of these, um, all of these warblers have found their ecological niche. Uh, they may overlap in some respects, but uh, their sweet spot or where they do the majority of their feeding they've established some type of dominance and the other warblers will stay away, okay? Okay, and I think we're at 49 minutes, so I think I'll go ahead and conclude this video lecture so I can post-process it and get it up on YouTube as soon as possible. And then um, we're at slide 16 on chapter uh, three. Uh, this has all been posted on Moodle. So I will continue in the next video lecture uh, will be posted as soon as possible.